Sometimes temptation isn't about being enticed in a different direction from the one in which we're heading. Sometimes temptation is about heading in the same direction, but just not going far enough. In the summer of 2012, Italian motorcycle racer Riccardo Russo was leading the Italian CIV championship race by a good three lengths with only one lap to go. As he approached the finish line to begin his final lap, He began to fist pump the air and then stood on his bike to celebrate. He mistakenly thought that it was the end of the race. As Ricardo Russo continued his celebrations, rider after rider shot past him and he finished a humiliating 14th. The race commentator could not believe what he was seeing. He is celebrating and I think the race is still going on here. And he has not realised, shouts the commentator, who described Russo's actions as the most appalling error of judgment. I think there's a lesson here for all of us. Today, the first Sunday in the season of Lent, we think about how Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and there he was tempted by the devil. Jesus had just been baptised, and God the Father had just declared his love for him and said that in him he was well pleased. Soon, he would go back home to Nazareth and launch his mission. This was a crucial moment for Jesus. What was it that he had been put on earth to do? As Jesus ponders these big existential questions, so the devil, with all the charm of a management consultant, offers Jesus some suggestions. If you are the son of God, said the devil, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Way back when God provided bread from heaven for the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness, it says the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. But you know, that is not how the world is. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is ever-widening. We see families queuing up at food banks, people struggling to eat or to heat their homes or just to get by. And yet there are 177 billionaires in the UK with a combined wealth of £653 billion. And there are 2.85 million millionaires. Many of those who have much have too much. And right across the world, those who have little face hunger, malnutrition, disease and death. Every day, 25,000 people die because of hunger and malnutrition. 10,000 of those are children. Surely, if God is God, then his number one goal should be to eradicate food poverty. But Jesus says to the devil, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't care about food poverty. Jesus feeds a crowd, turning what looks like thin air into bread, not once, but twice. It says that when Jesus saw the hungry crowd, he had compassion for them. But he knew that he had to go further. There was something broken in the hearts of people that bread alone could not fix. And the same is true today. It is, of course, right that the church comes to the aid of the poor and the hungry. It is a good thing, a good thing that the church is involved in the running of food banks. There are now over 2,500 food banks in the UK giving out millions of parcels every year. This is kingdom work. But even if we succeed in running the best network of food distribution centres, lifting countless people out of food poverty, that alone would not be enough. Having dismissed the first temptation, Jesus encountered the devil again. The devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus could have done things that would have left people in no doubt that he was the Son of God. In the Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, the agnostic brother Ivan Karamazov writes a poem called The Grand Inquisitor, 
set during the Spanish Inquisition in the 16th century. In the poem, a disguised Jesus visits the city of Seville, where heretics are daily being burned at the stake. The Grand Inquisitor, a cardinal described as an old man, almost 90, tall and erect with a withered face and sunken eyes, recognises Jesus and has him thrown into prison. In prison, the Grand Inquisitor confronts Jesus in a scene that resonates with Matthew's accounts of the temptation of Jesus. The Inquisitor says to Jesus that by turning down the three temptations, Jesus forfeited the three greatest powers at his disposal, miracle, mystery and authority. He says that Jesus should have followed Satan's advice and performed those miracles on demand so as to increase his popularity among the people. Jesus could have proved beyond doubt that he was worthy of all worship. But, says the Grand Inquisitor, instead of taking possessions of men's freedom, he increased it and burdened the spiritual kingdom of mankind with its sufferings forever. By resisting Satan's temptations to override human freedom, Jesus made himself far too easy to reject. He surrendered his greatest advantage, the power to compel belief. But Jesus never chose the easy way out. He never took the shortcut solutions to human needs. He had the patience to allow God to work in a slow, gentle, gracious way. He never seized control himself, nor compelled others to help him further the causes he believed in. He certainly never traded his freedom for the guarantee of safety and protection, nor accepted compromise in order to realise his ambitions. Jesus made decisions that would ultimately lead to his being rejected. Instead of being seeker-friendly and entertaining the masses, sometimes Jesus spoke harsh words that actually drove people away. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, his own disciples said that his teaching was too hard, and they questioned whether it was acceptable. Many turned back and followed him no more. To the rich young ruler, Jesus set such difficult standards that he went away sorrowful. The Grand Inquisitor said that Jesus made himself far too easy to reject. He surrendered his greatest advantage, the power to compel belief. But Jesus never compelled belief. He always remains at your disposal. Back in the prison, the Grand Inquisitor said to Jesus that the church recognised the errors that he had made and has corrected them, that far from rejecting the powers of miracle, mystery and authority, the church has chosen to use them. Certainly the history of the church is checkered, to say the least. We have not been at our best when we have been powerful. And even when this country was described as a Christian nation, and everything the church did felt like a home fixture, and we were sustained and lifted by the support of all those around us, even then, We had not arrived. There was still work to do, for you can't just compel people to follow Jesus, whether by force or the weight of expectation or the precedence of tradition. People have to make their own choices, and that means that they can choose to reject us. So the devil tried to tempt Jesus for the third time. He took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus was offered a short cut to power, but he turned it down. Now, power is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can be an agent of good, breaking the yoke of the oppressed and establishing righteousness. Jesus could have been powerful. He could have overpowered the Romans, freed the captives and liberated his people. But it would not have been enough. Even while he hung on the cross, Jesus could still have done something and the temptation was still there. If you are the son of God, they said, then save yourself. But Jesus consistently chose nothing less than the way of the cross. George MacDonald once said of Jesus, Instead of crushing the power of evil by divine force, 
instead of compelling justice and destroying the wicked, instead of making peace on earth by the rule of a perfect prince, instead of gathering the children of Jerusalem under his wings, whether they would or not, and saving them from the horrors that anguished his prophetic soul, he let evil work its will while it lived. He concentrated himself with a slow, unencouraging ways of help essential, making people good, casting out, not merely controlling Satan. And then crucially, he adds, Jesus resisted every impulse to work more rapidly for a lower good. Jesus handed over power in order that he may more powerfully destroy the works of the devil. And today, Jesus still calls us to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow him. And if we really took up that invitation, if we chose each one of us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Christ, then what a revolution would sweep through the church. We would come to church not because we wanted to, but because we needed to. We would need each other's help. We would need the support and encouragement of our sisters and brothers in Christ. We would need teaching, training, equipping. The Church of England has its national headquarters just around the corner from the House of Commons. We still have bishops in the House of Lords. It is not for nothing that we are called the established church. And of course, we still dare to call ourselves the Church of England. But friends, all that power and prestige alone is still not enough. Now, I have to be honest with you. I love the church and I'm enormously encouraged by so much of what I see. Our work as a sign and an agent of the kingdom, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, inspiring the hopeless, it is brilliant. But there is more. We are, on the whole, really welcoming to newcomers. Do you know, things like coffee after the service is still quite a new innovation. I first came across it about 40 years ago, about the same time that we started shaking hands with each other during the service. We are so much more personable more warm and sociable, more seeker-friendly. But still, there is more. The way we use our power and position as a force for good is a commendable thing. And the truth is that although we are facing a loss of membership and the attrition of our power and influence, we still enjoy quite a privileged role. But even if, even if we were right at the heart of the affairs of women and men as once we may have been, even then there would still be more. The terrible temptation that we face is to think that we have done enough, to think that we have finished the race. Like Ricardo Russo, who celebrated because he thought he'd done everything that there was to do. We need to be careful that we do not make such an appalling error of judgment ourselves. Or in the words of George MacDonald, We must resist every impulse to work more rapidly for a lower good. As someone said to me once, we haven't come this far to just come this far. But the answer to what more there is to do does not lie in more activity or more popularity or more power. Ultimately, the temptation Jesus faced was to pull up short of complete surrender. The greatest temptation Jesus faced was to avoid going to the cross. And that is our temptation too. So the more that there is to do is about surrender and sacrifice and giving ourselves wholly and wholeheartedly to God. Some time back I was talking with George Lins, one of the authors of Mission Shaped Church. I asked him what one thing he would want the church to do and he did not hesitate in his reply. He said the church needed to repent. We need to repent, to change, to be recreated, to be transformed into the church that Jesus has called us to be and longs for us to be. Not necessarily popular, but ready to live with integrity, ready to help people grow closer to God. Not compelling belief, but choosing instead the slow, unencouraging ways of help essential, making people good, Casting out, not merely controlling Satan. And not necessarily powerful, but in our apparent weakness, discovering the strength that comes from God alone. 
So may Jesus mould and make and reform his church, that we may be all that he is calling us to be. And may we be ready to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Amen.